Hi, my name is John Goldsmith, and this is a first in a sequence of videos that I'm making about a book that I'm writing along with a friend and colleague, Del Nilax. The working title of this book is The Real Origins of Generative Grammar, which is what it's about. It's a follow-up to a 2019 book that Belnar and I wrote called Battle in the Minefields, which I highly recommend to you. In this new book that we're writing, we look at the origins of generative grammar, work of the young Noam Chomsky, and we pay a special attention to the work of Chomsky's advisor, mentor, teacher, Zelig Harris. And this first video is about the life of Zelig Harris up until the 1950s. There's a lot of history here. There's a lot of background that is relevant to understanding Zelig Harris's life and to understanding Noam Chomsky's life and interests as well. Let's take a look. Beyond the Pale, that's where Zelig Harris was born in 1909 in the city of Balta in Ukraine, about 100 miles north of Odessa and not too far from what is today the sleepy country of Moldova. But his life was spent in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania as one of the most influential and creative linguists of his generation. He was brilliant and he knew his work was important. He was also imposing, charismatic, infuriating, shy, modest, or demanding, depending on who you ask. He was deeply involved in Zionist politics of a sort that's rarely heard from today, but he made sure that he left little on paper that might make the FBI particularly interested in what he was doing or saying or thinking. No other linguist in his generation had a group of students around him that could begin to compare to those who were around Zelig Harris. Noam Chomsky was his most famous student after all, and not just Noam Chomsky. And yet today, his work is little remembered, neither in linguistics nor in politics. How is that possible? Let's go back to the beginning and take a look and try to understand. Zelig Harris's family belonged to Ashkenazi Jews, the community of Jews in Central and Eastern Europe. The Jews in Russia lived quite literally beyond the Pale, the Pale of Settlement, which was a line established by Catherine the Great, Tsarina of Russia in 1791. The Pale was a line of states, which is what a Pale is, first cousin to Pole um, or Impale. That, and this line marked out the places where in the Russian Empire a Jew could live. The imperial edict allowed the Jews to live in Ukraine, Poland, or most of the Baltic territories, but not in Russia, not in Moscow, not in St. Petersburg. Keeping the Jews out of Russia did nothing to stop violent uh, anti-Semitism, though, and the waves of mobs focused on killing Jews and destroying Jewish property brought the word pogrom into use in European and American newspapers, especially after the vicious riots in Ukraine and Poland in 1881. The attacks were especially horrific in 1905, and more and more Jews felt the need to leave their homes and families behind and find a new life somewhere else, and that somewhere else was mostly the United States. Fiddle on the Roof set that story to music for a much later generation. When Zelig was four years old, his parents moved to the United States and settled in Philadelphia, establishing a home in a city where cultured and socially aware Jews found a welcome. New York and Philadelphia were the cities where the largest numbers of the roughly two million Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe had arrived, most of them with few possessions and no capital except what was in their heads. Philadelphia had had a synagogue even in colonial days when a large number of Sephardic Jews from England and Holland had found refuge there. The arrival of the Harris family was much like that of other linguists, both older and younger than Zelig Harris, who will play roles in our story. The family of Edward Sapir, who is a generation older than Harris, um, and eventually Harris's mentor for a brief while, was much like that of Harris's, and the family of Noam Chomsky himself, a generation younger than Harris, had much in common as well. The other great American linguist of Sapir's generation was Leonard Bloomfield, whose family had come to the United States a whole generation earlier than that of Zelig Harris. Bloomfield, Bloomfield's family came from the German-Jewish bourgeoisie that had secularized and become more German and less Jewish, as was evidenced, for example, by their use of German at home 
rather than Yiddish or, or Hebrew. Another linguist who will play an important role in this story is Roman Jakobsen, who came from a Russian Jewish family, but his was an educated bourgeois family that had managed to escape from the internal exile imposed on most of the Jews in the Russian Empire. The second half of the 19th century saw a slight loosening on the, of the conditions placed on educated Jews living in the major Russian cities. Jakobsen's immigration to the United States was forced not by the pogroms, but by the Nazi German assault on Central Europe in the late 1930s. Jakobsen's foremost student, Morris Halley, was also a Central European Jew whose family fled Latvia just days before the Nazi troops marched in, and Halley would in turn become Chomsky's closest colleague and collaborator. This list of the most influential linguists in the United States over the past century attests to the significance of the flow of Jewish immigrants into the United States over this period. Naturally, the Jewish immigrants to the United States arriving around 1900 reflected the society from which they came, a society in which religious education was highly valued and where education had everything to do with learning languages. The home language of the Jews in the Pale was Yiddish. In Jewish communities, religious ed education was expected of all boys, and this meant learning a second language, Hebrew, and how to read and write it. For some, it meant learning a third language, Aramaic, so that one could read the Talmud and the Kabbalah, which provided discussions of complex problems of common law, essentially, and ideas about a more mystical strain of Judaism. The goal of education in the most traditional regions was to allow men to read the Torah and the commentary on the Torah, and to engage in discussion and argument about the meaning and consequences of both the original text and the commentaries that had been made in Hebrew and Aramaic by scholars in years gone by. Jews around the world were largely divided up into two groups, the Sephardic Jews who traced their ancestry to the Jews of Spain and who were expelled by the crown in 1492, and the Ashkenazi Jews um, of Central and Eastern Europe. The Ashkenazi were in turn by the late 19th century divided into a Western and an Eastern group. The Western group was better integrated into the ambient society in which it existed in England, in France, in, in Germany, where forces were strong that encouraged the use of English, French, and German at home rather than Yiddish, and to a growing secularization as well, facilitated by the legal assimilation and integration of Jews into the body politic. The Dreyfus Affair in France around the turn of the 20th century illustrated both the reality and the precariousness of this integration in France. The Eastern group was composed essentially of those in the uh, lands of the Russian Tsar, where most of the Jews uh, lived in the Pale of Settlement, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago. Jewish immigrants faced the same choice as virtually all immigrants in the United States, regardless of where they came from. What language would they speak at home? In the land that they had come from in Eastern Europe, the Pale of Settlement, Yiddish was the nearly universal language spoken at home. But to be Jewish was often to be multilingual, since learning Hebrew was a responsibility of all males, and speaking Russian or Polish was often a necessity and all the while, German was the language which provided an entree into intellectual opportunities. Zelig Harris's family was among the very few that chose to speak modern Hebrew, an option that only arose because of the work of Eliezer ben Yehuda, beginning in the 1880s, aiming to create a modern version of Hebrew and revive it in the present day. Hebrew had not been a living language for anyone for over 2,000 years, and the idea that it could be revived was far-fetched indeed. But in the end, the effort succeeded, and it remains the textbook case um, and the only striking success of efforts to revitalize moribund languages, a success that was in due, and to no small degree, to the passion with which the task to revive Hebrew to life was embraced by many Zionists. And many of the immigrants to the United States were themselves Zionists, looking forward to a time when they or their descendants would find a home in Palestine. If Zelig Harris's family was Jewish and one which maintained Jewish traditions, it was also a secular family and it did not take being Jewish to mean believing in God. 
Harris's family celebrated the important Jewish, fest Jewish festivals and holidays and served as a lodestone for many members of the Jewish community in Philadelphia. Harris, as we've seen, spoke Hebrew at home. He spent several of his high school years in Palestine. Tammy Harris, one of Zelig Harris's daughters, recounted some events from her father's youth. My father was not easily defined. His thinking was original and independent, but he was definitely a socialist. In the case of my father, he knew poverty. At the age of 13, he was sent by his family in Philadelphia to live in Palestine. This was a rather peculiar way of expressing Zionism, but times were different, and who am I to judge? He studied at the Herzliya Gymnasium and worked to support himself. I think he lived in a youth hostel with some 20 kids in a room. At the age of 17, his aunt and uncle moved to Tel Aviv, and he finally had a home and the means to study more and work less. His uncle, Yehuda Kaufman Ibn Shmuel, was a well-known writer and philosopher. His cousin, who was eight years old at the time, was Bruria Kaufman, who later became his wife, but in a way was always more of a loved family member and less of a wife or a woman to both of them. This family tree is a little bit complicated. Here we have Tammy Harris, who is the daughter, the adoptive daughter of Zelig Harris and Bruria Kaufman. Bruria Kaufman's father is Yehuda Kaufman. Uh, Zelig Harris's mother is Yehuda Kaufman's uh, sister. Kaufman was seriously engaged in intellectual pursuits, all of which seem to have had a major impact on young Zelig. In fact, Kaufman's career seems to remarkably foreshadow Harris's, and it's for this reason that his career deserves our attention. Yehuda Kaufman was born in 1886 in Ukraine, in the city of Balta, the same city where Zelig Harris would be born 23 years later. And as a young man, Kaufman studied a Russian and Jewish curriculum in Balta and Odessa. At the age of 18, he traveled west and studied in London and Paris, learning English and French along the way and taking courses from a number of French luminaries of the time. It was while he was in Paris that he became especially attracted to socialism and to Jean Jaurès's perspective in particular. Jaurès was the leading socialist in France at the time, and he was assassinated in 1914. Kaufman traveled to Russia around 1906, and he became a student at McGill University in Montreal, where he studied Semitics. While Kaufman was in Montreal, he became deeply involved in the development of Jewish life and culture there, and became engaged with Poale Zion politics. Poale Zion, which means workers of Zion in Hebrew, was a Jewish movement of Marxist activists who were committed to Zionism and partisans of the development of modern Hebrew. It had broken off from the Jewish labor bund, which was a large movement that had a broad base, um, and it broke off when the bund rejected Zionism in 1901. Members of the bund committed to Zionism, left, and formed Poilet Zion. Kaufman became a widely known public speaker in both Canada and the United States, speaking on topics of, of Jewish history, politics, and culture. In 1916, Kaufman applied to Dropsy University in Philadelphia, not long after it had opened its doors as a university for advanced work in Jewish studies. It's now part of the University of Pennsylvania. Three years earlier, his sister Rachel Harris had moved there from Balta, along with her husband Hyman, uh, and their children, among whom was Zelig, as we've already seen. I know the family tree is complicated, but it's not unimportant. Kaufman moved to New York a few years later, and then in 1926, he emigrated with his family to Palestine. His family now included a young daughter, Bruria, born in New York in 1918. And it was then, as Tammy Harris noted above, that Zelig Harris, who was already attending high school in Palestine, moved in with the Kaufman family, and Bruria will come back to this story in a moment as a grown woman. Zelig Harris came back to Philadelphia after high school to become an undergraduate at the Uni University of Pennsylvania, not far from his family home, where he was drawn to the study of ancient Semitic languages, 
just like his uncle Yehuda Kaufman had been, and perhaps under his influence. There were strengths in this area at Penn, as the university is universally known. Zelig studied with James Montgomery, a devoutly Christian student of the Bible, as well as of Arabic, and more important for Harris, of the Ugaritic texts that were discovered in the late 1920s and which predated uh, the Hebrew of the Bible. Shortly after getting his bachelor's degree in 1930, Zelig Harris began teaching at Penn, and he defended a doctoral dissertation in 1934 on Phoenician. It was published two years later by the American Orientalist Society under the title, A Grammar of the Phoenician Language. It was a major step forward from the previous grammar that had been written of Phoenician, which had come out in 1869. Harris's book was reviewed in the journal Language by none other than Edward Sapir, who wrote that the book, quote, not only fills a long felt want, but is already a classic in the field of Semitic linguistics. The acclaim with which it has been met by a number of authoritative Semiticists testifies to its great merits. That's what uh, Edward Sapir wrote of Harris's book in his review in Language. Harris also published a book-length study of some of the Ras Shamra texts the same year, co-authored with his advisor, James Montgomery. And finally, in 1939, he published a book on all of the Canaanite dialects, also reviewed very positively by Sapir. This was already an astonishing list of publications for a young scholar who had just turned 30. In the years before the Second World War, linguists would congregate for a two-month stay at a linguistics institute whenever they could, a summer extravaganza organized by the Linguistic Society of America and often held in those days at the University of Michigan. And while today the institutes are held every other year, the tradition has continued to this day. Harris was invited to teach at the institutes from 1937 to 1939 and this period marks the transition from his being a scholar of the Semitic languages to being a general linguist, developing the theoretical ideas of Edward Sapir and Leonard Bloomfield, and cultivating his linguistic credentials by working on indigenous languages of North America. It's likely that Sapir's review of his, of his work brought Harris's name to the attention of the Institute's organizers. Sapir knew Harris before the Linguistics Institute's in 1937, Sapir's son snapped a photo of the two of them at a Sapir, at Sapir's country home uh, in 1936. We don't know quite when the two met. In the end, Sapir would come to view Harris as his intellectual heir. Sapir suffered a heart attack at the end of the 1937 Institute, and he didn't recover from it. He remained weakened, and he passed away in 1939. Harris turned 30 in 1939. His career took a turn from Semitic philology and historical linguistics to mainstream general linguistics beginning in 1937, and this transition marked a familiar path that's taken by many in the early years of their academic careers. A student spends their years in graduate school absorbing all they can of their advisor's intellectual values and their sense of intellectual adventure, and spends the next five to ten years answering in their own fashion the questions passed on to them by their advisor. At that point, some researchers, but only some, realize that it's time for them to leave the intellectual home with, within which they've been nurtured and set off on their own course. And that was what Harris did. He realized that the direction he wanted to take was one that had been opened up by Sapir and Bloomfield. He had spent his 20s following the intellectual path defined for him by his advisor, James Montgomery. That was fine, and that gave him the opportunity to have a secure position at the University of Pennsylvania. But it was not a path that looked much like the path of the up-and-coming linguists in the United States. The young linguists of Harris's generation were almost to a one working on the native languages of Native Americans. Anyone at the LSA Summer Institute could see that perfectly well. Harris became friends with Carl Vogelin, a linguist and an anthropologist, who had had a postdoctoral fellowship with Edward Sapir, and the two of them worked on Hidat's materials, which had been collected by Robert Lowy, one of Oglin's teachers at Berkeley and a former student of Franz Boas. 
Hidatsa is a Native American language spoken in North Dakota, and it's closely related to Crow. The next summer, Harrison Vogelin taught a field methods course at the 1938 Linguistics Institute with a native speaker of Hidatsa. And they published a book based on the Hidatsa materials in 1939, establishing in that way credentials in the area where American linguists could be expected to have some experience, the indigenous languages of the Americas. The 1938 Linguistics Institute was a great success. In addition to the course that Harrison Vogelin taught on Hidatsa, Bloomfield was there teaching a field methods course on Chippewa, a different Native American language. And he also taught a general introduction to linguistics, which everybody at the Institute attended. Harris thus turned a page in his career after spending the 1930s doing historical Semitics. The next chapter in his career would stretch from around 1937 to around 1946. It was a period during which he published a lot in language. These articles were polishing, developing, and refining the ideas that Sapir and Bloomfield had passed down to his generation, to Harris's generation. When he was done, he integrated this work into a book that he called Methods in Descriptive Linguistics. The title that it was published under eventually would be Methods in Structural Linguistics. He was ready then to move on to his own ideas and become his own man. I'd like to turn now to politics. Politics was a big part of Zelik Harris's life, and politics was part of what drew Noam Chomsky originally to, uh, to work with Zelik Harris. Harris was deeply committed throughout his entire life to a vision of society in which workers had control of the workplace, a vision that was essentially anarchist or anarcho-syndicalist on the margins of socialism. He was not so much a revolutionary as someone who hoped to see a new kind of workers' organization arise within the American economy, one which would gradually replace the capitalist organizations which have formed modern, the modern capitalist uh, economy. He spent good portions of his life working on a kibbutz in Israel, and his hope long before there was a state of Israel was that the future homeland for the Jews would be one in which Jewish and Arab workers, uh, Jewish and Arab workers could work together jointly in control of their working place. For Harris, as for many, Palestinian and later Israeli kibbutzim represented an attempt to create a new way to organize the lives of people working and living there. Each of them, each kibbutz in a sense, a test case for Harris's conception of the way in which modern, capitalist, uh, modern capitalism needed to evolve. Tammy Harris, one of Harris's daughter, remarked, for years he lived uh, in Israel as a kibbutz member. He worked just like everyone else, as a farmer, a driver, or a factory worker. He never neglected his scientific work, but he did it only in his spare time. Never, never did he take one minute off of his work on the kibbutz in order to do his scholastic work. He initiated and then uh, worked for many years to establish a kibbutz university. His objective was to combine his socialist ideology with academia, but even that was only on his spare time. That's from Tammy Harris. This was a theme that was constant for him throughout his lifetime. Early in his adult life, from his years in college up until his uh, 30s, Harris was deeply involved with a Jewish organization in the United States called Avuka, Hebrew for torch, just as one of Avuka's goals was to provide a light for others to better see what was before us. It would be a fitting name for any group that saw itself as an avant-garde. Avuka was founded at Harvard University in 1925, shortly before Harris entered as a freshman at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Avuka aimed to create chapters on college campuses throughout the country, and Harris joined the chapter at Penn. By the mid-1930s, he was one of the national leaders. Harris had hopes that Avuka would adopt his vision and his goals, which would mean finding a way to move past capitalism as it existed to find a new mode of organization in which human beings would find meaning in their work and develop relationships in, in ways that the late stages of capitalism made impossible. That hope proved to be illusory, but Harris's efforts in Avuka lasted for years and had a real impact on a number of young people with whom he worked. The political world in the 1920s and 1930s was different in many ways from the world established after World War II or from the world as we know it today. 
on the international stage, the creation of the Soviet Union in 1917 gave focus to many on the left, where people began to look to Moscow as a moral leader to fight against the capitalism, which they saw as the root of the problems faced in the United States and elsewhere. Not everyone on the left believed that the Bolsheviks in power in Moscow were deserving of their support. And this gave rise to a pro and anti-communist split among groups on the left, a split that became evident right from the very start of the Soviet Union. The mainstream response, however, in Europe and in the United States to the success of the Soviets in Russia was quite different. And the revolution there in 1917 was viewed with deep suspicion and anxiety. In the United States, uh, there was a response to this as early as 1919, when Attorney General Mitchell Palmer staged, staged a series of raids and arrests of communists, socialists, and anarchists and others on the left. The split between Stalin and Trotsky, which led to Trotsky's leaving the Soviet Union in 1929, in turn gave rise to a split among communists on the left around the world. Um, but it was not until the famous show trials in Moscow between 1936 and 1938 uh, that a strong anti-Stalinist position attracted large numbers of American communists. Uh, and this led many to view themselves not as Stalinists, but as Trotskyists. Just being alive during the Great Depression of the 1930s, which began at, in, in Wall Street in October of 1929, uh, just being alive then uh, was evidence enough for many that the American capitalist system had deep flaws which inevitably led to misery and homelessness on a scale that left uh, many with very little hope for the future. Germany had been devastated economically by the demands placed on it by the Versailles Treaty at the end of World War I. The treaty established a new European political map after World War I and political forces both on the left and on the right in Germany struggled for control throughout the 1920s, as was true for much of Western Europe. In 1933, Adolf Hitler came to power as Chancellor of Germany, and he immediately let loose with a series of actions that led to the loss of jobs, of homes, and all legal rights, and eventually to the concentration camps that we know about today for the Jewish citizens of, of Germany and eventually other countries in Western Europe. American public sentiment during the 1930s did not press for a military engagement with Germany. America remained largely isolationist throughout the decade. This was the international context in which Avuka was born and thrived. Avuka was never a large organization. During its lifetime, it had perhaps a thousand or two members, give or take, largely of college age, and it came to a precipitous end in 1942. Throughout its second half and almost until its final throes, Zelig Harris was at the center of the organization, and the drama of Avuka's end is closely linked to the major events of its time, as well as to Harris's political commitments and personal style of work. It's an interesting story. There were competing visions of what Avuka was supposed to be. For some, it was a social organization where Jewish students, especially those who were intellectually inclined, could meet and get to know one another at a time when anti-Semitism, both on campus and off, was often overt. For most, Avuka was a Zionist organization, which meant at the very least that it was supportive of the notion that Jews needed a homeland in which there was no risk of anti-Semitism overwhelming the national political scene, as was happening in Germany at this point. By this time, too, Palestine was fully adopted by many as the place which would be a welcoming home for Jews from around the world. I'd like to talk about a couple of people uh, who were young men associated with Avuka, members of Avuka, and close to Zelig Harris. And Harris's interest clearly inspired them to become involved in political movements over the course of their careers. And these are three people who were older than Chomsky, but it's clear that the effects that uh, Harris had on young young people that he worked with were, were shared both by these young men and by Chomsky a few years later. The three people I have in mind are Seymour Melman, Nathan Glazer, and Seymour Martin Lipset. All three are, are 
were are very well known. Uh, maybe Glazer and Lipset a little bit more than Melman, but hard to say. Harris remained close to Melman for the rest of his life, and, and Seymour Melman became an economist. He was widely known for his efforts to make plain to the American public what the social costs were of the heavy investment in, in what he called Pentagon capitalism, like what Eisenhower referred to as a military-industrial complex. Nathan Glazer was drawn to Avuka uh, when he was a student at the City College of New York, known as CCNY. Eventually, he became editor of Avuka's national newsletter. Glazer was part of a circle of friends, uh, all students at CCNY, that included Seymour Martin Lipset, Irving Howe, Daniel Bell, and Irving Crystal. Like Bell and Crystal, Glazer came to be seen by the media in the 1980s as a model of the neoconservatives. I remember that well, many of you probably don't. But as students in the 1940s, all viewed themselves as strictly on the left side of the political spectrum. Glazer would later become a well-known sociologist and a public intellectual from the 1950s through the 1980s, one of the founders of the magazine The Public Interest. When he was an undergrad at CCNY, he attended a talk in the early 1940s by Seymour Melman, who had just come back from a year in Palestine that had been funded by Avuka. Uh, after the talk, Glazer went up to him and, and talked to him. Melman was charismatic, he said later, and soon Glazer was involved in Avuka. The charisma, the charisma might have lain, as, as Glazer said, Glazer said um, that in the fact that the people at Avuka, here are his words, were intellectual socialist Zionists and looked down on non-intellectual socialist Zionists. Avuka, on the whole, appealed to those on the anti-Stalinist left. In short order, Zelig Harris recruited Nathan Glazer into his world of linguistics and politics around 1943, which is obviously the middle of World War II, just before Glazer graduated from CCNY. Harris and Seymour Melman gave Glazer the political readings that they thought he needed to uh, develop his consciousness, and Glazer began doing Harrisian linguistics with support that Zelig Harris was getting from the War Department at that point. Glazer remembered that Harris would take the train up to New York and they would meet to discuss Glazer's work partly on Moroccan Arabic and partly on Swahili phonology, projects that Harris ended up integrating into his 1951 book, Methods of Structural Linguistics. Glazer later remembered, Harris took a somewhat dismissive attitude, he, he said, towards linguistics. If you weren't a theoretical physicist then you weren't serious. So I said, what do I need to know about it? And he said, you don't need to know anything. Here are two books, this is it. And one was Bloomfield and the other was Sapir. Glazer also gave a revealing picture of the Avuka that he knew and he wrote the following. Avuka, following the pattern of other left sectarian organizations, had study groups in which we read not only Zionist classics, but also socialist classics. Bukharin's historical materialism was particularly favored by some of our elders, but we were not Leninists. Though left and critical of social democrats, the radical leaders of Avuka who tried to influence, influence us were Rosa Luxemburgian, revolutionary, but against a um, directing central party and for education of the working masses. It was a very congenial bent the only issues that called for action were Zionist ones, and for the rest, education was sufficient. The doctrine hardly mattered, I am convinced. It's almost embarrassing to say we believed in revolution. The only way to relieve the embarrassment is to confess that we really did not. One of Harris's colleagues in Avuka was Irene Schumer, who remembered Nathan Glazer as one of a number of young people that Zelig Harris drew to him. Schumer observed, talking about the war years, Harris promoted his work by recruiting students to some of the projects in which he was engaged, including learning and teaching foreign languages. The language work was po important politically as well as linguistically because Harris was anxious to keep a core group of Avukaites with him in order to foster the interests and the approach that he favored. Schumer's description seems to describe Harris's efforts with Noam Chomsky when Chomsky began to attend Harris's seminar as well. 
Uh, Robert Barsky has written in the authoritative um, biography of Harris, reports that Glazer, quote, recalls that the inner circle developed a sect-like character that excluded the larger, larger number of members from outside New York who were traditional Zionists and who knew little about the radical orientation of the group around Harris. Judith Wallerstein, who had become a widely respected psychologist, was in Harris's inner circle of young people in the early 1940s, and she recalled the scene with the eyes of a psychologist, and she wrote the following. In order to understand Zelig's psychology, you had to understand his background. And in order to understand the background, you had to understand that Zelig Harris, in particular, had very little contact with a wide range of people. He and his immediate circle developed their own ideas about the way the world should be, based on what would make life better for an immigrant kid. Their immigrant roots are, are very important. Seymour Melman and many others in that milieu, including Al Khan, came from poor families and they were making their way into American life. They did want to be assimilated. They also wanted to hold, to hold on to however they interpreted their identity. For Zelig and Seymour, there was an interest in being Jewish, but there was also an interest in changing the whole world. The motivation was very personally driven. It was a passion, especially for Seymour. Zelig was not a very passionate man. He was a one-track man, and to me, really not very interesting. Howard Orleans, also part of this circle, remembered this. The longer and the better you knew Zelig Harris, the more you were likely to perceive and to be offended by his coldness, his inability to recognize or establish genuine friendship based on genuine emotions. He didn't recognize the role of emotion in history, art, politics, or personal re relations, and that is or was a very big blind spot. Well, others who knew him knew that this was not the whole truth, but Harris often kept parts of himself hidden from those he felt had no need to know. Orleans also remarked, every person who knew Zelig Harris well harbored some sort of disagreement with him. We, those in his inner circle, hardly ever disagreed with him tete-a-tete -tete, because Harris talked so much better than we did and could be more than just a little overpowering. And even Chomsky expressed as much, although more about the linguistics than the politics. Meyer Rabban was another person who was in Zelig Harris's inner circle, but he joined the army during World War II. And when he was back from a service, he went, uh, he went to Columbia as a grad student in psychology. And he and another friend in the Harris Circle, Murray Eden, uh, decided to drop in on, on Zelig and Berea uh, Harris. And uh, he recalled that Harris was uh, very distant and very cold. And in Barsky's book, he, he reports the following. Perhaps, thought Raban, he was angry because I hadn't stayed in Israel, that I'd come back for an academic career. Raban remembers thinking, to hell with this guy. He spouts off all of his all of these ideas, and he sticks to his brilliant academic career. But all of us other guys also have good academic careers, and he puts us down if we don't stick to the program that he thinks other people ought to follow. I soured on his aloofness, on his preciousness, on his being above everyone else, his guru status. He was always in the right, and he knew what was best. His mental faculties were far beyond those of the common folk. This was true but it led to the way that he interacted with other people, and I now look upon him with sour feelings, but I don't want to erase that initial impact of those years, 1935, 36, 37, 38. And if neither Wallerstein nor Orleans felt it themselves, there were many who felt that Harris exuded a charisma that drew them to him. Maya Rabban saw the charismatic side of Zelig, who was, in his words, a person who came across as someone at a level beyond ordinary people, which is truly the aura that gurus of all colorations possess and exude. He literally, he literally set for me a series of beliefs to which I became committed. Sometimes the followers take on small personal mannerisms of a charismatic leader. Noam Chomsky remembered precisely that happening with students of Harris. He met Nathan Glazer in the 1960s 
and saw the familiar Zelig gestures and mannerisms. He asked Glazer if he'd ever known Zelig Harris, and Glazer said, yes, how did you know? Mark Liberman, who's a linguist who was a grad student at the same time that I was at MIT, had the same experience. When he, when he saw Zelig Harris come to give a talk, he saw uh, any number of mannerisms that he associated with Noam Chomsky. He saw them in Zelig Harris. Well, the end of the Avuka organization came in 1943, and that end had everything to do with the state of the world at the time and with Harris's own hopes of how Avuka should relate to his own political goals and views. And it had to do with how he worked with other people around him. For many, the news coming from Europe at this point in the early years of the war, that news was devastating. It put concerns for the future of capitalism on the back burner. The horrific news was of the collapse of the countries that Hitler's army invaded and the powerful waves of anti-Semitism that rocked Western and Central Europe. The United States entered the war at the very end of 1941. By mid-1942, news filtered out from occupied Poland about Nazi massacres that were taking place. Edward R. Murrow reported on December 13th, what's happening is this, millions of human beings, most of them Jews, are being gathered up with ruthless efficiency and murdered. The phrase concentration camps is obsolete, as out of date as economic sanctions or non-recognition. It's now possible only to speak of extermination camps. In July of 1942, information was widely reported in the United States about mass exterminations of Jews in Treblinka, Poland, and this shook the feelings of quite a number of the members of Avuka. For a large group, surely the largest group, of American Jews, the only thing that mattered at this point was to defeat the Nazis and halt the massacres of Jews in territory occupied by the Nazis. And this was true as well for members of Avuka. As an organization focused on young people of college age, Avuka's members were signing up in large numbers to enter the war, and many were no doubt drafted. This was a challenge for Harris's goal in two ways. There would be little reception for a political thrust that cared more about post-capitalist anarchism. And just as importantly, many young men were leaving Avuka to join the military draining the organization of their energies. Harris's conception of Avuka led him, even before the war, to position it as a movement to include not just college students, but a, but a wide audience, including both high school students and young people already graduated from, from college. And beginning in 1938, just after Harris stepped down as president of Avuka, it began to clash with other Jewish youth groups in the United States. Avuka defended its position by saying that it was offering an understanding of the world for young Jewish people to find a way in which Zionism could be a response to the rise of fascism. The Zionist Organization of America, or, or ZOA, provided about a quarter of Avuka's budget. And when it looked into what Avuka was doing with its money in the early 1940s, it was not satisfied. They wrote, uh, your definite program makes you a faction, a party, the mother organization charged, and it demanded less indoctrination to come from Avuka. Avuka's response was, we don't want to serve our group's afternoon, t afternoon tea and teach that Judaism is nice. Alfred Kahn, who was the leader of Avuka at this point, wrote in 1941, we've come into conflict with traditional points of view, more limited concepts of Zionism, and also with Jews who refused to accept the full implication of a program of Jewish action, preferring hush-hush to all out. At the end of 1942, the ZOA drew a line in the sand. They said Avuka would have to change its direction, drop its support of a binational state in Palestine, and acknowledge the authority of the ZOA. If it did not, the ZOA would drop its affiliation with Avuka and it, uh, instead adopt Hillel as its university representative. Important point now. At its meeting in December 1942, Avuka decided to go it alone. 
without any oversight from ZOA, but more importantly, without ZOA's funding. The New York office, which had been central to Harris's group, was forced to close for financial reasons. And Harris's group withdrew from Avuka. But the withdrawal was complicated and it was painful. Early in the 2000s, Robert Barsky, the author of the, the biography of Zelik Harris, Robert Barsky interviewed many of the young people involved in these events in the early 1940s. And their recollections were in many cases still painful these many, many decades later. Several Avukaites, Robert Barsky wrote, several Avukaites believe to this day that Harris and Seymour Melman decided in early 1943 to disband Avuka in the face of impending changes to its orientation towards saving Jews from annihilation rather than creating Jewish-Arab cooperation in a socialist Palestine. But this decision reflected as well some of the prevailing attitudes that Harris and others held about Avuka being controlled by the women who stayed behind in the United States, while growing numbers of Avuka men were enlisted to fight in the army. End of quotation from Barsky. Irene Schumer, an active member of Avuka, recalled that the departure of so many young men led Lillian Schoolman and herself to take larger leadership roles in the organization. We represented moderate voices, she recalled, not in line with what Harris wanted. And she remembered, quote, a blow up by Zelig and by Seymour Melman, unquote. The story involves the national meeting of Avuka in June 1943. And it was, as it was told later to Barsky, Zelig Harris had hoped to create an elite from the New York chapter who saw things the way he did. And along with a nucleus from the group, Zelig sought a way to, quote, control the elections. The people involved included Seymour Melman, Nathan Glazer, Al Khan, and Maya Rabin. Glazer brought Seymour Martin Lipset into the group. Glazer said later, Harris was intent on preserving this elite. The plan was that they had to assure the offices of Avuka at the next convention, which was in 1943. The notion was that they would have to control the elections. So it's true that we were a kind of cabal in the group and we had our candidates. And in retrospect, you might say we represented a faction. But days before the elections were held at the annual meeting, Lipset got together with the Avuka people from New York who had not been brought into the conversations, the people who knew nothing about the cabal, if we want to call it that. Irene Schumer was one of those who heard about this for the first time then. She recalled the shock, that was her term, of being told that the plan had been for, quote, the unreliable elements, the counter-revolutionary elements, to be eliminated from the leadership, to be replaced by those who were, quote, ideologically pure. She remembered Marty Lipset as having, quote, exposed the plan for the putsch, the work of an inner circle that was trying to take over the organization, unquote. She was dumbfounded. The world seemed, in her words, so awfully dark. Nathan Glazer confirmed the events with Barsky, remembering that Lipset had just changed his mind and could not keep the plan secret from those with whom he had been so close. And so, Avuka came to a halt, never came back to life. Its center of mass on the East Coast vanished in June of 1943 with a collapse of Harris's cabal, if we call it that. And while Avuka came back to life later in Cleveland, later in that year, it came to an end formally in 1946. Harris's political interests and energies would continue, but henceforth, without any attachments to a formal organization. Harris's attempt to take over Avuka failed, but just how he took this failure, we cannot know. It didn't change his engagement with politics, but his engagement with politics was always different from most other people's. His was very intellectual and aimed at figuring out what the end, end game would have to be. That is what the ultimate form of a just and equitable society would look like working on electoral politics, or even contributing to the intellectual life of the left-leaning intelligentsia of the United States did not appeal to him from everything that we can see. We'll see Harris refocusing his political efforts with what he called the Frame of Reference program.
Harris's linguistic work in the 1930s was largely on the history of the Semitic languages, which was, after all, what his job was about as a member of the Department of Semitic Languages at, at Penn. But at the end of the 1930s, his political work began to involve a small group of men whose thinking was similar to his own to discuss questions of society and politics. And it was around this time that he began to think about how the scientific study of language uh, could play a role as a tool to help understand the nature of modern society. Harris believed that it was possible to identify an ideology that misled, or the term he used was fooled, the citizen and the worker, and that it was the job of the political vanguard to make that ideology clear and to show how it worked and to help others to be, again, this is his word, de-fooled. The tool that Harris had hoped would suit his purpose here was the transformation about which there will be much more to say, but we're not quite at that moment yet. By the 1950s, transformations were at the center of Harris's work and Chomsky adopted the term developing it in a new and different direction. From a political point of view, Harris hoped that transformations would be the means by which a linguist could separate the content from the grammatical deformations, which might in some cases have a purpose that was essentially ideological. Perhaps it would be possible to take the political writings of someone who we don't like, let's say like Sidney Hook, the philosopher who started his career as a staunch intellectual on the left, and who had become better known as a defender of mainstream American political faith and figure out what was offensive about what he said and what he wrote. It's of the utmost importance to observe that the story of Harris's political education and engagement brings us to transformations. That could never be said of Chomsky's story. Chomsky has developed several conceptions of grammatical transformations, but none of them has been developed out of his political beliefs and commitments. For Harris to discover transformations that are used by speakers of a language is to provide us with a means to create what mathematicians call a normal form, which is one that puts all candidates into a consistent form that allows for objects to be easily compared. For Harris, the key was to use transformations to undo effects and to arrive at a core, a kernel, which has all the rights to call itself the meaning of a sentence. Philosophers have spoken of separating form from meaning. Well, a linguist now is trying to show them how it can be done. After Harris's death, three of his friends found a manuscript that he had been working on that laid out his central ideas. And in 1997, it was published under the title, The Transformation of Capitalist Society. And in this book, we have the only explicit statement that Harris has left for us of his conception of a more just and humane society. While the references that he makes in his book are all contemporaneous, the fundamental perspective that he lays out there isn't different in, in any fundamental ways from the perspective that he espoused throughout his lifetime. Harris's political orientation was consistently aligned with the left, but certainly against the Leninist and all the more Stalinist directions that defined the second Soviet revolution, the Soviet revolution, the second revolution in, in Russia, uh, and the Soviet Union that arose and emerged out of that revolution. He cited approvingly the work of people such as Anton Panakuk and Rosa Luxemburg, who rejected Lenin's work as early as 1915. How could Harris's vision of worker-controlled workplaces come about in a world of the sort that he knew in his time, that is the early 1990s, Harris harbored the hope that in the inevitable periods of economic and business downturn, it would be employee-run businesses that would attract people's attentions because the workers there would not be laid off, the workers there being an essential part of the business itself and couldn't be separated from it it's still a reasonable thing to hope for. We noted earlier that Broya Kaufman was the daughter of Zelig's uncle, Yehuda Kaufman, and she was nine years younger than Zelig. She had grown up in Palestine where Zelig had lived with her family for a brief period at the end of his high school studies. And, and then she moved back to the United States in 1940 when she was 22 
a gifted woman with talents in mathematics and in music. She stayed first in the capacious house of Hyman and Rachel Harris, Zelig's parents, where Zelig also lived. And Maya Rabban tells a story about what happened next. Burry announced that she was moving out, out of the house, and Zelig couldn't understand why. And Zelig mothers turned to him, Zelig's mother turned to him and said, you're an idiot. You don't understand why she left. She's in love with you. Well, Bruria and Zelig were married the following year in what's been described as an arranged marriage, arranged by Zelig's mother. Theirs was not a passionate couple. Bruria earned her PhD at Columbia University in 1948 in mathematics. And then she worked until 1955 at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, New Jersey, working with John von Neumann and assisting Albert Einstein. In 1960, she moved back to Israel. Gloria Kaufman lived on the Mishmar HaAmek kibbutz, very often with Zelig Harris, and it was there that they adopted their daughter, Tamar. In 1964, Harris married Naomi Sager, who spent her professional career at New York University as a computational linguist. In 1965, they had a daughter, Ava Harris, who's presently a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, as well as a recipient in 1997 of a MacArthur Genius Award. And um, Ava Harris's work has focused in the area of infectious diseases in third world countries and the delivery of effective healthcare services. Harris was instrumental in founding the Department of Linguistics at the University of Pennsylvania just after World War II. And it's sometimes taken to be the oldest Department of Linguistics in the country. Other departments have made the same claim, such as the Department at the University of Chicago. Over the years that followed, he worked closely with some of the very best graduate students that entered the field, listening to what some of those students and Zelig's colleagues have had to say it's not hard to see that he left a deep impression on them. Some saw him as a reclusive, and others felt privileged to be allowed to get closer to him. Many revered him and held him in awe. Some were turned off by him. George Cardona, a linguist of South Asian languages, a quarter of a, quarter of a century Harris's junior, recalled, Harris, to me, was a genius whose quirks had to be forgiven because he was a genius, and I did not develop a close personal relation with him. Despite his ever cool demeanor, he generated passions among those in his circle in linguistics, just as we have found in Avuka. Of all his students, Noam Chomsky was the one to become the most famous, breathtakingly world famous. Chomsky began working with Harris in 1946, just after the war was over. And he continued to work with him through the 1950s, though his contacts were less after Chomsky went to Harvard as a Harvard Junior Fellow in 1951. How much, yet, how much less is really hard to say at this point. There are very conflicting stories on that score. Chomsky was close to Harris in so many ways. Their political views were aligned, their religion, their Zionism, and yes, their linguistics. As a freshman, Chomsky was uninspired by the material that he was being taught and thought seriously about dropping out. Chomsky's father contacted Harris to ask if he could help Chomsky, Chomsky Noam Chomsky, get interested in his work, and Harris agreed to try. Harris's wife described the relationship that arose between Harris and Chomsky as an, quote, almost uncle to nephew thing. The families were very close and Noam was mentored by Zelig. Chomsky began attending Harris's seminar and worked through the manuscript that Harris, Harris had just completed, the one that would eventually become Methods and Structural Linguistics. Harris contacted Nelson Goodman in the philosophy department at Penn and encouraged Chomsky to see him. Goodman was close to Willard Van Ornum Quine at Harvard University. They'd been friends and worked together since graduate school days, Goodman and Quine. 
Goodman and Harris made the case to Quine, who was senior fellow at Harvard. He was senior fellow of the Harvard Society of Fellows. Goodman and Harris, Nelson Goodman and Zelig Harris, made the case to Quine, who was a senior fellow of the Harvard Society of Fellows, that Chomsky would be an excellent contribution to the Society of Fellows, and Quine followed through. Chomsky was uh, adopted as a uh, Harvard Junior Fellow, and he spent four years at Harvard writing a long book manuscript called The Logical Structure of Linguistic Theory, which we will look at in a later chapter. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself in the story, so let's go back to Penn when Noam Chomsky was an undergraduate and he was working with Zelig Harris there. Harris took Chomsky under his wing, recognized his brilliance and his potential, and expected great things of him. In the end, he was disappointed and felt that, quote, Noam's ambitions took precedence over the relationships that gave him a start. That's a quote from uh, Zelig Harris's wife. Harris saw Chomsky as taking his work and using it without attributing it to Harris's own research program, and he took it hard. His daughter, Ava Harris, looked back and said of Zelig and Noam, this is a quotation, they were like father and son in terms of intellectually working together, and then politically. And then there was this huge rupture when Noam, in order to further his career, took stuff and didn't attribute it. We couldn't mention his name, Ch Chomsky's name, ever within 20 miles of my father because it was so upsetting to Zelig. I've seen him sometimes when he would get that upset and he would just freeze up and leave the room. It was terrible. You could not go anywhere near this. We'll look more at the rupture in a later chapter. It's a classic case of rupture on a personal level tied to the continuity, tied to continuity on the level of ideas. We've seen some difference of opinion as to whether the students in Avuka saw Harris as charismatic. Oh, how could it be otherwise among linguistic students? In working with most of his students, Harris maintained a constant compartmentalization of his life. There were a small number of cases involving Nathan Glazer and a few others where Harris combined some aspects of his political and scientific interests, but for the most part, he kept most people in the dark about what was happening in his life beyond what he thought they needed to know. There are too many examples of this to, to give them all, but the most striking is something that uh, Noam Chomsky remarked, that the people at the kibbutz where Harris spent much of his life did not know that he was a linguist when he was in the United States. Some thought he might be a sociologist. When we asked Chomsky a question about Harris's early years, he replied, no idea, long before my time, and he never talked about the past. Michael Katz was a student of Harris's at Penn from 1965 to 1968, after which he transferred to UCLA. He remembers Harris as teaching the fall semester, only appearing on campus one day a week, but he remembers other faculty following the same one day a week policy for their appearance in the department as well. In the spring, Harris would be on his kibbutz. Jeffrey Kaplan remembered how Zelig would teach, and he wrote, Harris held his one class in his office during semesters when he taught. His office was a regular faculty office that is small. He sat in his chair and 15 or 20 students crowded in there, sitting on chairs dragged in or sitting on the floor. He would announce during the first class that the course would go on until some date about halfway through the actual semester, for example, in the spring, late March or early April. Then he would tell us what he wanted to talk about and then started talking. We took notes furiously. I, tr I know I tried to write down every word he uttered. There were not many questions. He never used a blackboard. He may have had a few notes, but he seemed just to talk extemporaneously. Kaplan was a student at Penn from 1968 to 1974, and he described what was going on then. His theory at the time, and really I think the final version of it, is displayed in his paper, The Two Systems of Grammar, Report, and Paraphrase. It's a theory kind of like classical generative semantics without the language external metalanguage. Harris just did his thing, never referring to fundamental ideas like that, 
and never referring to others' work like Chomsky's. Hedge Ross had been at Penn for a year before I got there, and once somebody dared to ask a question about his dissertation and his work on syntactic islands, I wish I could recall Harris's words. I do recall what he implicated, namely that that was all fine, but we here at Penn were doing something more important, figuring out the properties of language with no abstract structures. And oh yes, Ross was a nice guy who was here for a while. He was more explicit about MIT syntax, ephemera. Not long after Harris's death, William Watt, another one of Harris's students, wrote the following. He taught many, myself included, to probe deep and to respect the data. He was a merry but exacting taskmaster. He was venerated by all who knew him, surely, and by many was held in warm affection. He was quick, he was wise, he held scholarship to be a calling worthy of one's best efforts and one from which the personalities of its practitioners are best held apart. That's what uh, Watt wrote. Harris's principles told him that the individual was never what mattered in doing science. It was only the science that counted. But life is always more complicated than that. The students entered into a relationship with him as a teacher. That teacher does not disappear simply because there's no place for him in his picture of what science really is. Watt continued, and he said this, Oddly, perhaps, given his expressed wish to suppress personality in science, his own individual character was strongly expressed and strongly felt. Around such a person, inevitably, legends abound. One of them concerns his reclusiveness. Few of his students had ready access to him, and I was once importuned by one of them, after he'd spent a full year at Penn, at least to point Harris out. I was able to direct his attention to the receding taillights of an aging gray Mercedes as it vanished up Walnut Street. And in my day, which is 1959 to 1963, he had appointed the formidable Miss Sparagna to serve outside his office as a sort of Cerberus. This she did with great relish. In fact, as time went on, her blinds were often drawn and her lights turned off, lending further weight there in the gloaming to Harris's inapproachability. Like all of my fellow students, I think, I revered Zelig Harris as a mentor and as a resident genius, like more than a few, I had a warm affection for him in my own case as a sort of intellectual father. This affection was only increased by my personal interactions with him, not just in his office, once regularly admitted, but also more casually on the streets of Philadelphia. That's the end of what Watt said. Edward Keaton, a distinguished professor at UCLA, who has worked on a broad range of topics and syntax, recalled that, quote, I've always regarded Zelig as something of a saint. You could talk with him about most anything, informal, technical, and at some level he understood. He was a most respected presence in the department and was a true scholar, trying to figure out what is never trendy or catchy, easy from anthropology to algebra, so he didn't at all share the antipathy for formal work that we see in some linguists today. That much I've inherited from him, a most worthy role model. Lee Lisker, who studied linguistics with Harris and became a distinguished phonetician and Harris's colleague at Penn, recalled him as, quote, approachable, intense, and moreover, inspiring, particularly, of course, for those in the inner circle. He remembered that Harris was on a first name basis with many of his students, something that was very much out of the ordinary in those times, though that faded as Harris became older and the age gap between him and the students grew. Lisker's experience did not include all of the compartmentalization that we've referred to. He said, and he frequently met with them, the students, in restaurants or at his home for linguistic and political discussions. Noam Chomsky remembered frequently the graduate seminar in the late 1940s would meet at the Horn and Hardot restaurant or at Harris's home. We noted earlier that Nathan Glazer worked with Harris during World War II. Glazer's particular work under Harris involved teaching languages to soldiers, and he told a story to an interviewer that gives a sense of Harris, Harris's perspectives at the time. Why would Harris hire someone with no serious background in linguistics? And Glazer explained, 
Harris took a somewhat dismissive attitude towards linguistics. If you weren't a theoretical physicist, then you weren't serious. So I said, what do I need to know about it? And he said, you don't need to know anything about it. Here are two books. This is it. And one was Bloomfield and the other was Sapir. I know too that he gave me at least one article, which is by the Chinese linguist Y.R. Zhao about alternative solutions in phonemes. Another one of Harris's students a few years later, Noam Chomsky, had a different recollection. As students, we never heard from Harris about Sapir. I knew he was there, but we never read him. We didn't read much at all with Harris, and in particular, we didn't read Sapir. Lila Gleitman, who had become a leader in the study of child language acquisition and a professor of psychology at Penn, remembered the same thing happening at the end of the 1950s. She told me the following. When I applied to linguistics to be a graduate student, I think in 1959, Harris called me in and asked me why I wanted to come. He said, among other things, that we don't teach real courses here. Well, dazzled by the modern sound of this, after all, I was a former Antioch undergraduate and trying to sound smart, I said, oh, well, it'll be enough if you recommend a few books for me to read. He said, well, I, re I memorized much of what he said, I thought he was God. He said, there's nothing worth reading in linguistics. Just go to Florence once a year and look at the David. Well, I had never been to Europe, no less ever read any book about language or linguistics or logic. This is all speaking to the ahistoricity of Harris, which was truly appalling, as I discovered many years later when I read in its historical, systematic, richly reasoned forms, every little generalization I had tried to make in Jesperson. I didn't even know there was a Jesperson until I first stood in front of a Swarthmore class making a fool of myself because I didn't know anything. Harris thought that linguistics started and ended with him. In the first few years of the program, Gleitman found a charismatic Harris willing to talk and have lunch together regularly but she experienced a painful rupture in what she called an intense academic relationship with Harris. Something snapped, she said, as she began to do her own work in the field, even though she fully recognized that her own work was deeply indebted to her advisor, Harris. Lila recalled that she learned something of Harris's point of view about what had happened only in the 1970s when a scholar in the linguistics department newly appointed to the department suggested offering Lila a courtesy appointment, to which Harris, Harris responded that that would happen only over his dead body. Lila recalls that at the time of their rupture, Harris criticized her for, um, for using his ideas in her first publication, and Lila agreed, saying that everything she knew about linguistics she had learned from him. This happened in the early to mid-1960s, and we asked her if it was possible that Harris was feeling angry about how Chomsky had been using Harris's ideas in the years leading up to this. Uncredited and perverted, Lila said. It's possible, she said. Hard to know. She said her rupture with Harris might have been the stormiest, though it was not as cataclysmic as Noam Chomsky's, she thought. Harris's was a wonderful mind, she said, but sometimes wonderful minds live inside of jerks. Gleitman noted, all this pales into insignificant compared to Harris's treatment of me. He intervened with a provost at Penn to try to derail an appointment here in education to me while I was at Swarthmore. Luckily for me, Penn was so anxious to appoint a woman that they overrode him. I was prohibited from the linguistics department, though. My dear mentor and friend, Henry Hernixvall, did not intervene in this as his life was devoted first and foremost to Harris. Many years later, the linguistics department wanted to give me a secondary appointment, and Harris said he would not come back to the linguistics department ever if this happened. The department, for about the first time, defied him and offered me that appointment, and Harris, true to his word, did never attend a linguistics department meeting again. She learned that this was because I had supposedly stolen the conjunction work from Harris and published it in language. Harris might not have disagreed entirely with Gleitman's remark that he thought linguistics started and ended with him. Ellen Prince was a graduate student working with Harris, who later became a member of the faculty in the department and a president of the LSA as well, as Lila Gleitman did too. Prince remembered a conversation with Harris not too many years after Gleitman's time in the department. 
Prince used the phrase, the field of linguistics, and Harris demurred. Linguistics isn't a field, he said. It's a problem I was working on, and they took it away from me and made it into a field. Anne Daladier, a French linguist who received a fellowship to work with Harris for a year in 1975, recalled Harris as a man of exceptional shyness. She spent a year working with him and recount, recounted many years later the unusual way in which she ended up having a productive year. She arrived at the University of Pennsylvania campus in Philadelphia and found he wasn't there. The department thought he was in Israel at the kibbutz on which he lived a good part of, of the year. Reaching the kibbutz in, in Israel on the phone, Dalajay learned that Harris was in New York due to a medical concern in the family. In the end, the medical issue kept Harris in New York for the next year, and she was able to meet with him in his home. For Harris, the best use of his time was to sit and think somewhere where nobody would disturb him. Later in his life, Harris was not pleased when he learned of plans afoot to organize a fest shift in his honor. He wrote to William Watt, who was organizing the volume in his honor, saying that this was, quote, matter, a matter in which I have human rights. Such a publication would be a deep personal affront to me and to my sense of values. I've managed to live this long with the principle that scientists can be people who do the very best work they can for the sake of knowledge and of its human value. Any special and unavoidably invidious recognition of that work, such as honors, prizes, and festschriften, is abhorrent to me and would violate what I feel is a human right and dignity. Many years ago, during Bloomfield's lifetime, I had to get a similar project stopped for Bloomfield's sake, and I'm sorry now that I have to do it for myself. I'm sure, however, that you will understand me and will respect my principles, even if they may seem excessive. Bruce Nevin was a student of Harris's in the last half of the 60s who worked in the years since Harris's death in 1992 to make Harris's ideas accessible. And he's tried to show how Harris's beliefs about language and how to be a professional played out in the arc of Harris's career. It's characteristic of Harris, he wrote, that there was no vanity or self-importance in him. He knew that his work had lasting importance and treated it as such but he was no guru or empire building seeking followers and would not accept any such role being projected onto him. Those students who sought entree into linguistics as a social institution in academia were bound to be disappointed. Well, that's not a perspective that plays well in the wor world of the university. Students generally come to graduate school to learn something that they can use to build a career and they expect moral support from their advisor in this. And that was not what Harris had to offer. Nevin continued, however, he could scarcely be blamed for their disappointment. He did not provide such entree, nor did he pretend to, and in my hearing actively discouraged students who imagined work with him would further their ambitions in the field. Nevin remembered his courses with Harris with fondness. He wrote, he had a sink or swim approach like that attributed to Sapir, except that his seminars were, of course, focused on theory rather than the data of, say, Athabaskan. He would come into his seminar and just start talking about what he was working on. When I started with him, this was the work that resulted in his 1968 book, Mathematical Structures of Language. The process was not a lecture or a monologue, but a continuing conversation with the students, trying out alternatives, posing and working out problems for a mathematical characterization of language. After a while, with intensive outside reading, one began to catch on and to participate. Well, there's one last question to raise, even if we can't answer it, and it's this. Can Harris's ideals for a new way that people can work together cooperatively in councils be carried over to the scientific work, the scientific research that he did and his work in graduate education in universities. These were the two great parts of Harris's adult life, after all, which he spent in research and graduate education. It was ultimately the reason why his paycheck arrived at the end of each and every month. There's no evidence that Harris put the two great projects of his life next to one another,
to compare and contrast the workers' councils he thought should manage, the factories, and the graduate seminars he taught with no hope for the future careers of his students, who were his co-workers. But for us, looking back at Harris, it's a natural question to ask. What would have to change in the world of the university or the world of linguistics for Harris's ideas and his ideals to play out in the creation of new knowledge and the preservation of old knowledge? That is a hard question to answer. I'll come back to it in a later chapter. I'm not sure I have a real answer for it. So this brings us to a close of this chapter on Zelig Harris and his life and part of his career. We'll come back to later questions later involving his interaction with Noam Chomsky later on. I know we've covered a lot of territory. I hope that you can see, first of all, how all of our discussion of history had a huge impact on Harris and on the community that he lived in in Philadelphia and how Zelig Harris's person and his ideas and his goals and his drives had an impact on Noam Chomsky, who we will be talking about pretty soon.